Good afternoon. Thank you. Oh, listen to the sounds. Hark. That means we've begun. My name is Corlene Kraft. I'm president of the club, and thank you very much for being here, coming in this beautiful day. I noticed everyone had smiles on their faces as I was walking here this morning, so that's, that's a good thing. I'm just sorry that we don't have an atrium here instead of this beautiful ceiling so we could open it up. In any case, we're very pleased to welcome our guest for the first time, Vanessa Gaston, who's the current uh, director and CEO of the Urban League, so we're very glad to see her here and interested to hear her remarks, the title of which are Urban League of Portland, A New Day, A New Direction. I'd also like to recognize, sitting in the back of the room, a group from Stand for Children, who are a nonprofit agency who are education advocates. And uh, we have them to thank for the convincing the legislature and Gover Governor Kulongoski to increase funding for K through 12. So thank you very much for your efforts. Um, if I, the nagging part here is please turn off your cell phones or anything else that's going to make noise and disturb our speakers. And on that note, I would just like to add that in the interest of keeping everything interesting and providing much more than you've paid for, we understand that the group that's meeting next door will be having a drum concert beginning at 12.30 and going till about 12.45. It's from Taiko, who is the Japanese um, organization that does drumming, so please feel free to enjoy it, <laughs> and you're welcome. <clears throat> now just a few announcements before we begin. Um, next Friday Forum, we're going to have quite an interesting and international program. Our speakers will be Jonathan, or I beg your pardon, Jonah Gokova, who is the chair of the Zimbabwe Coalition on Debt and Development, Ana Maria Nemenzo, who is president of the Freedom from Debt Coalition, Philippines, and Neil Watkinson, the National Coordinator of Jubilee USA Network. Their topic will be a growing consensus on full debt cancellation, why it makes sense, and it will be co-sponsored with the World Affairs Council and Mercy Corps. Now it is time for you to hear of more of the virtues of membership in City Club. I see a lot of new faces here today and I'm happy to see that, but I'd like to see you more regularly. And so Jake Okenberg, is going, who is a member of the Board of Governors and he is the membership chair, and he works for Oregon Business Council and helps coordinate the Oregon Business Plan as well as telling you the virtues of belonging to City Club. Jake Okenberg, please. Thanks. Uh, welcome to our, our program today. Uh, my name is Jake and I have had the fun task this year of trying to bring in a ton of new members and we're doing very well. And I think we're doing well for a big, big reason, one main reason, that for almost 90 years the City Club of Portland has been trying to build community here and doing it quite successfully. They truly care, we truly care about building a new civic model, one in which all citizens can be engaged no matter where they're from no matter what their background. And that's the thing I wanted to stress to everyone today, that all people of this region are welcome to become members of the City Club of Portland. And in fact, to incent that today, we've got a few things I just wanted to share with you. One for, for all of our friends from the Urban League, uh, today and in the whole uh, month of April and May, if you join, we will waive the $25 new member processing fee. So please join us and that small incentive will hopefully uh, move that along as well. There's two other things that we're going to be doing for all potential new members. Uh, first of all, we have a monthly raffle during our membership drive. We have tickets to OMSI, tickets to PGE Park, all of them free that if you get drawn out of that raffle, if you're a new member this month, we'll give those to you. And then today, something very special, courtesy of Chamber Music Northwest. Many of you have heard of Amani Wins. Uh, they feature five outstanding musicians of African American and Latin heritage that joined forces in 1997 to create an ensemble that would push the boundaries of, tra of traditional wind, excuse me, wind quintet. And the group, they've now played around the nation, they played around the world, and they're gonna be here 
on Wednesday, April 27th, this coming week at Reed College, and we have four pairs of tickets. So for the first four people that sign up as new members today on your way out, we will give you each a pair of tickets to that wonderful performance courtesy of Chamber Music Northwest. So thank you so much for being here today. For those of you who are not members, I hope you consider joining our family and uh, enjoy the rest of your program. Thank you. All that and a free drum concert today. So a few more um, comments about what's coming up in the next few days. Uh, there are still just a few tickets left of Sunday's matinee performance of Fuente Ovojuna. It's at Miracle Theater, and there will be a post-play discussion with the director and with the actors. Uh, you can buy tickets at, on the way out or over at City Club uh, offices on 9th and Washington. Our Citizens Read will be held on mon Monday at 7.15 over at the City Club com <coughs> Commons, pardon me, and the title of the book, if you haven't read it by now, is Collapse. I'll make no more comments about the title. Um, and it will be moderated by Illahi President Peter Schoonmaker, or Schoonmaker, check one. Uh, our final Friday open house will be April 29th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. and Cafe Voila will be open. It's a great opportunity to ha just have some fun and chat with new members as well as friends that you haven't seen very often. So please come and bring friends or new members. Details on all of these events, by the way, are in your bulletin or you can find them at our website at pdxcityclub.org. You can also buy tapes our audio tapes or videotapes of this program today. And before we begin, I would like to recognize our sponsors this quarter. They uh, underwrite these broadcasts, and so we're very grateful for them. Pope and Talbot, Providence Health Systems, and Zimmer Gunsel Frasca. So now we move on to the program with the guest we've been anxiously awaiting, who is Vanessa Gaston and she became president and CEO of the Urban League in March of 2003. She holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Washington, where she focused on education and social, po social policy administration. Prior to coming to Portland, she worked 12 years in Washington state government as administrator in the Department of Social and Health Services in Seattle and ran a long-term care veterans facility. She also has an extensive background serving on statewide and local community boards and commissions dealing with various social employment and educational issues. She was recently appointed to Oregon State Board of Education and also serves on the Portland Schools Foundation Board of Directors. So welcome please, Vanessa Gaston. Good afternoon, and I promise when the drums start, I'll try to speak loudly so everybody can hear me, uh, but I don't think I'll have any problem um, doing that. Um, thank you for coming out today on this sunny, beautiful Friday, and I'm, it's so wonderful to see so many Urban League supporters in the audience. Um, I appreciate you coming out and supporting the work that we do, and for those of you who are not um, Urban League members. We encourage you to also join and become Urban League members and also support the work that we do. I also want to thank the City Club of Portland for inviting me to come speak to you today. And I'm honored to be here sharing information about the work that we do and plan to do in the future and why we do it, um, as well as the future direction and why is it so important for people to get engaged right now in such challenging and interesting times. I have been, again, mentioned before, as it was mentioned earlier, I have been with the Urban League for two years, and every day is dedicated to working to open doors, to give people access to equality and opportunities so that they can be successful in areas of education and economic security and improve their lives. Just to give you a little background about what the Urban League does and who we are, we are a nonprofit community-based organization. We were established in 1945. We provide direct services and outreach, and we do provide advocacy to, for positive change for African Americans and other disadvantaged people. We are affiliate of the National Urban League. And when we were created um, in 45, we were brought out here by Portland officials to help integrate newly um, African Americans who came to Portland from the South for jobs. 
and they didn't know what to do with all these African Americans. And so they asked the Urban League to come out here initially to send them back down south. <laughs> but the Urban League let people know that's not what we do. We help you integrate into the community, help them integrate people into the community around housing, training, and employment. Um, and if they were serious about that, then we would help in that. Otherwise, um, Edwin Bill Berry was going to go back to New York. And Portland decided, um, well, let's work with the Urban League. And that's how the Urban League got established um, in 1945. We are 60 years old. We've been through a lot of ups and downs. Um, but that's a long time for an organization um, that has our kind of mission in a place like Oregon where you don't have a lot of diversity. So um, I'm proud to, proud to be part of such an important mission. Now, one of the things I wanted to kind of um, um, help people understand the difference between the Urban League and the NAACP is I, as I've been here for two years and get to know what the Urban League does, a lot of people confuse our work with the national of the NAACP. Um, both organizations do fight for equality for African Americans and other disadvantaged groups. But the big difference is, is the NAACP is an advocacy organization focused on civil rights. And the, the Urban League, we also fight for social justice, but we're also a direct service provider. And we do outreach and we do advocacy for those who do not have a voice. But the biggest difference is the NAACP is an advocacy organization and we also provide, but, um, and we provide direct services. But over the last two years, um, it's been very challenging. It's been also been very interesting and rewarding. The Urban League of Portland um, is led by an interracial board of directors, very committed, and I see some of them in the audience today, and I thank them for being here. Um, it consists of business and community leaders who come together, who believe and value the importance of equality. The board and staff spend a lot of time focusing on rebuilding this organization to overcome some past troubles. But we established some goals that focus on financial responsibility and soundness, increasing partnerships, providing high quality services to our clients, and also developing our staff. Our mission is more focused, and we expanded the area we tried to serve to reach people that moved out of North and Northeast Portland, due primarily to gentrification. As we were here, as we watched over the last um, 20 or so years, more and more African Americans um, have lost housing, can't afford to live in neighborhoods they grew up in, and so they're moving out to other parts, Vancouver, Southeast Portland, Washington County, Clackamas County, and so one of our goals is, is we want to see if we could try to reach out to, to those groups of people that have, were kind of forced to go out to areas outside of their own community. And I'm proud to say we have had success in turning this organization around in such a short period of time. We were able to do this because of a committed board, and I'm fortunate to be able to work with excellent staff that are dedicated and hardworking, because I don't do the work, they do the work. And the product that you see, the services that, you, that our clients get to know, and if you get to meet any of my staff, you realize that not one person could have turned this organization around, and it's them committed staff that really helped me to really help us stay focused and provide quality service, and I want to thank them. I want to thank them. But before I go into what we do and where we are going, I want to share with you some data as to why the Urban League is needed now more than ever before. The data I'm going to share with you does talk about issues of race and poverty. I have found since, that, since I've been here in Portland, people here in Portland do not like to talk about race. It's very uncomfortable for them. But I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't bring to your attention these disparities. And so I am going to focus on them. And I'm going to focus on the disparities between African Americans and their white counterparts. Now, recently, the National Urban League just completed its State of Black America in 2005, where it looks at the status of African Americans in the areas of health, education, economics, social justice, and civic engagement. And the report revealed that the overall status of African Americans is just 73% compared to the conditions of their white counterparts, unchanged from last year's report. And one area has actually gotten worse from last year's report, and that is in the area of social justice. And if you're actually interested in reviewing and reading this in retired report, I invite you to go to the National Urban League's website. It's a wonderful and very thorough report. 
But today I want to talk to you about the status of African Americans here in Oregon. The 2000 census shows that African Americans make up about 2% of Oregon's population, with the majority living in the Portland metropolitan area, more specifically Multnomah County. In Oregon, the buying power of African Americans increased from 456 million in 1990 to 930 million in 2002. So even though we are a small percentage of Oregon's total population, we are huge consumers in this state. But we continue to have equality gaps in different areas. In health, black Oregonians die at a medium age of 65 years compared to 76 for white people. The risk of death on average is 36% greater for African Americans than for Caucasians here in Oregon. The four highest causes leading to this statistic is homicide, diabetes, AIDS, and alcoholism, all preventable through prevention, education, and treatment. Economics. We have a gap in home ownership here in Portland. 38% of African Americans owned a home compared to 59% of their white counterpart. And when you look at the income here in Oregon, the unemployment rate in Oregon is currently 6.6%, and for African Americans, it's around 10%. Education. We have a huge academic achievement gap between black and white students in Oregon. In 2002-2003, only 20% of black students in the 10th grade met or exceeded benchmarks in math compared to 48% of their white counterparts. Only 26% of black students in the 10th grade met or exceeded benchmarks in reading compared to 56% of the white counterparts. Black students are dropping out of high school at higher rates, 9% compared to 3.6% of white students. And when it comes to students graduating from high school, only 1% 1.8% of our students received a diploma compared to 73.8% of white students. And in 2003-2002-2003 in school year, Portland Public School enrolled 52,969 students and had 2,324 major disciplinary referrals resulting in suspension or expulsion. This is data coming from a report by the Juvenile Rights Project. Caucasian students represented 60.3% of enrolled students, and African Americans represented 16.5%. And of that, of the majority discipline, ref, disciplinary referrals, 43.5% were black students, compared to 38.4% of white students. And during that same year, 8.13% of black students were suspended or expelled, compared to only 2.24% of white students. And the research shows, it is documented, that black students don't, be, don't misbehave any more than white students. And the referrals are primarily due to subjective behavioral issues. And when it comes to students attending college at four-year universities, of the undergraduates that enrolled in the fall of 2002 at all of Oregon's universities, only 1.7% were black, compared to 74.9% of white students. And that same year in 2002, only 1% of black students graduated with a college degree or certificate compared to 76% of white students. Now when we come to social justice in Oregon, of our total prison population, 10% consists of African Americans. As you can see, we have a problem and it continues to get worse. African American kids are not getting educated and are dropping out of school at higher rates. African Americans have few opportunities to find, to find livable wage jobs or own homes. We are sending increasing numbers to institutions, all right, but instead of going to college and universities, they're going to the prison systems. African Americans are dying earlier of illnesses that are preventable. African Americans are at the bottom of many areas, but yet we are huge consumers in this state. There is something seriously wrong with this picture. I was watching a tape a while back that talked about the conditions of African Americans in the 1940s, and it talked about how the Urban League got established. And I, it was sad to see that the conditions that were taking place in 1940s still exist in 2005. So as you can see, there are many issues facing African Americans and other disenfranchised people. 
But here at the Urban League, the board and the staff decided that in order for us to be effective and to be able to have a positive impact in this community, we had to remain focused. In the past, we tried to do it all, and we weren't that effective. So we felt we needed to be focused. So our, with our renewed seven-year strategic plan that included in community input, it focuses on two areas, education and economic development. More specifically, employment and advocacy for home ownership and small business support. Our goal is to work on closing the gap with income, wealth, and education. Two areas that can help break the cycle of poverty and despair and begin the process of building wealth for African Americans. Because if you do not receive a quality education, if you cannot even read and write, you will not be able to find a good job, making a good salary, or have adequate health care to be able to afford affordable housing, to be able to provide food on your table so that you can keep your kids off the streets, so that you can be in a position to own a home, and so that you can be in a position to save and invest money for the future. Our current advocacy and programs are around helping the most vulnerable people in our community and developing our youth. But I would just briefly mention some of the services. Uh, due to time, I won't have, be able to talk about everything we do, but we do have information out on the table. Please feel free to pick up some information. And if you're interested in specific how to volunteer or, or specific programs or how to be a member, please contact myself or pick up information on the table or contact our office because we would love for you to get involved. First, I'll talk about our Multicultural Senior Center, which serves 400 seniors in a month living in Northeast Portland with, through transportation, door-to-door -door transportation, activities to get them out their homes and be active in the community, and case management. It's a partnership between Multnomah County and Loaves and Fishes and other nonprofits in the area. We provide a meal for them Monday through Friday during the day. And the goal is to help keep elders in their homes and in the communities. We also have an education program called Centers for Academic Readiness and Success. It's an academic support program working closely with middle school students in Ockley Green Middle School, helping teachers and parents to help students that are actually so far behind in math our goal is to help them meet benchmarks. And the goal is for, for the students is for that when they hit the ninth grade, they're actually able, they're staying in school and that they're actually able to take algebra by the ninth grade. We also have a youth leadership group called New Lights. And the goal focus for that is to work and help African American high school students develop skills to be successful in the future through access to mentors of color, internships and engaging community events. We also have been very active in advocacy. We do a lot of work around the educational achievement gap, issues around community policing and racial profiling. We help to register people to vote, and we also participated in the National Urban League's Legislative Conference, advocating for more funding for our education, protecting our civil rights and civil liberties, and also helping to support programs that create jobs here in Oregon. We also have a young professional group that consists of young African-American professionals between the ages of 21 and 40 that get engaged in community events around financial literacy, HIV and AIDS awareness and education. And our future direction will have more emphasis on developing our youth with a continued focus on student achievement, staying in school, developing and building their skills through an internship and mentorship model and that will also support their needs and expose them to opportunities and other professionals of colors so that they could see role models besides who they run into on the streets. And as a part of this process, we will also work with parents and caretakers to help their children be successful. This is not an easy task because our youth are faced with so many challenges and many are in crisis right now. But the Urban League of Portland can't do it alone. And that is why we need everyone's support and assistance to help us empower African American and others to advocate for positive change and to open up doors for opportunities. We stand for equality for all. Portland is a great place for some people to live, but it needs to be a great place for everyone to live. This is a city that can be very successful if we all work together to help everyone have a quality life. 
We must focus on supporting our kids receiving a quality education regardless of where they live and attend school. It is not fair that a student has access to an outstanding school because his or her parents have money and have the luxury and privilege to go into the school whenever they want and demand the best and get it. It is not acceptable that we have such low standards for our kids in schools that have outdated resources and unprepared teachers. That's subtle racism, that's soft bigotry. Then we wonder why they're not successful. We have created a school system that consists of separate and unequal schools, and it's been that way for a very long time. It just didn't happen with no child left behind. Yes, parents must get involved, but the reality this is that this is difficult when a single parent is working hard to just keep a roof over her head, his or her head, food on the table, and keep the children out of the hands of the gangs and away from the drugs on the streets. See, some of us forget that we are fortunate enough to not have to deal with these issues, that we live in neighborhoods where we don't have to worry about guns and drugs on the streets. See, we forget that we have access to high-quality schools and that if we want to go in and advocate and spend some time in the classroom, we can do that. But we also must remember that it's about the kids. We also must remember the work the Urban League does is about helping people. It's about helping our youth. Kids deserve to have up-to-date books and computers and it's not, it's the, the time is not now to be blaming parents or blaming teachers or to be blaming the students. We want to always ask parents, why aren't you doing enough? Why aren't you involved? And we don't even understand their circumstances. But I will tell you, when parents do get involved, then we want to ask the question, when they decide that their kid can no longer be in these failing schools, why can't you stay in your neighborhood school? Why are you taking your kid out of your neighborhood school and going over to another school? And I'll tell you what a parent told me. She said, I can't wait for this district to fix this school. This is my child's future, and I can't take that kind of risk. You know, I was asked to speak to Tubman Middle School in early May at their excellence, awards and excellence event. And I have to tell you that um, this speech has probably got me more nervous than any other speech I've ever done, including this one. Because I have to tell you that in the last four months, I'm gonna, it's been a very difficult time for children in that school. I'm going to be in front of 294 students. And my message has to be about hope and inspiration. Because all throughout the news, TV, newspaper, all these kids have heard is how horrible their school is and how they're failures and how their school may close and how they may have to go to school with high school kids. Nothing good, nothing positive. And for me, this speech, I have to look in them kids' face and ask myself, as a member of this community, as a children's advocate, what do I need to do to turn this around for them? What do we need to do to turn this around for them? And we got to send that message to them so that they understand they matter and that they can learn and they will learn and we will help them learn and we will give them what they need so they can learn. Because in this process, we have blamed everyone Fingers have been going all in every direction, from the teachers to the principal, to the district, to the legislature, to the parents, to the community. And I've even been in forums where people have blamed them children. I've actually heard adults blaming them, saying it's their fault because they don't want to learn. People, let's not blame them for the mistakes that adults have made. The school system was never designed, let's be honest, it was never designed for them to be successful. And we have, we have done nothing to correct this. We keep saying we need more money. We keep saying we need better teachers. 
We keep saying we need better computers. The buildings are old and dilapidated. But when is somebody going to say and believe that these kids are going to learn? I've seen going to schools where teachers don't have all of what some of the other schools have, but because they believe those kids can learn, they have had turned tremendous results with little resources. So it's not all about money. Yes, money matters, but it is about the attitude. If you walk into a classroom and you see a bunch of kids that don't look like you, and automatically you make the assumption, they can't learn. They're not going to learn. They're not going to learn. I also want to say that we need to continue to just support these kids. You don't understand the message that go out in the community, the just conversations that we have amongst adults, how that impacts children. You think they're not listening? They are listening, and they're watching our behaviors. We continue in different ways to tell these kids how poor and stupid and unfortunate they are, and then wonder why they are not motivated and why they don't believe they can't learn. So how dare we blame these children, especially young children, for a broken system? When it comes to the business community and how they can help, there's a lot of things the business community can do. They can go in them schools. They can volunteer their time. Or maybe they can open up opportunities and partner to show that there are opportunities here for you in Oregon. That you don't need to leave this state for opportunities. And be committed about, be committed to that. Be committed to diversity and not just talk about it. And not just diversify at entry level jobs throughout the company. People need to see people that look like them in executive level positions. If they only see people that do janitor and customer service jobs, that's not what they want to see. They want to see, walk in and see somebody, an executive that looks like them making some decisions. And all I hear over and over is I can't find anybody. But maybe, maybe you need to stop looking for a person of a different color and trying to put them in a small little box. Maybe the box is the problem. Everyone in here comes from different backgrounds and has different viewpoints and different life experiences. And you know what? That is OK. Isn't that why America's great? Isn't that why they call us the melting pot? We're not supposed to be the same. And I challenge you to embrace diversity, even though you may not understand it and even though it may scare you to death. But in the end, Portland would be a better place for it. Now, when it comes to home ownerships, I mentioned earlier about gentrification and how people can't find affordable housing here in the city they grew up in, in the neighborhoods they grew up in. We have got to come to a solution about helping people to buy homes in their communities and plant roots where they want to live. We also got to start to support black and other minority businesses. If you want to talk about building wealth in a community, we have got to help them have a hand up so that they can get the technical assistance they need so they can be competitive. You know, and I can go on and on and on about other issues such as ending racial profiling in this city and, and strengthening community policing and training our police officers to deal with a diverse population, or funding health care programs so that pro focus on prevention and treatment, or, like I said, developing more affordable housing so people don't have to move outside of their community to live. And there are so many problems, but the Urban League can't do it by ourselves. And we're strengthening ourselves to focus on and do what we do best. But we need your help. And if we work together, we can, make, we can work towards closing these equality gaps and make the city a place where everyone can flourish. You know, when I first came to Portland, I think one of the very first groups that I spoke in front of, they asked me this question, does the Urban League have any enemies? And at the time, I couldn't answer that question. But if I think about that now, my response would be, Yes, if you don't believe in equality for all, then you don't believe in what we stand for. And I have actually ran into people who do not believe this, especially when it comes to all kids learning and achieving and all people making livable wages to feed their families and keep a roof over their head, or all people who want to own a home have the ability to buy a home, or if you don't believe in mentoring and developing our youth then you do not believe in 
what we fight for every day. So in closing, I just want to say that I appreciate the support of our business members and our individual members and our volunteers, for people who have been there for us for the last two years, because it has helped us tremendously and has helped us turn this organization around. And you have believed in our mission, in our work. When I read every day in the newspaper another nonprofit that perishes, good work that that was done, they fall by the wayside then it makes our work much harder. More and more people have stepped up to meet the challenge and support with the work that we do. And I encourage more people to do the same because it is a tough job. It's tough to stand up and be honest and tell the truth. It's tough to get out there and advocate and do what's right. But somebody, we all have to stand up and do that. And together we can partner to address and actually close these equality gaps if we truly believe that that is what needs to happen. So I want to say thank you for your continued support. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you the City Club of Portland for having me. And most importantly, our work has just begun. Our work has just begun. We have so far to go. And thank you for your support. Well, I knew we'd be pleased to hear from Ms. Gaston, and we are. <clears throat> I'd like now to open our question and answer session, and we have one microphone in the center of the room. And our board host today is Marcus Samantel. He's a member of the Board of Governors, and he uh, uh, shares the oversight of the Issues Committee for the club. <clears throat> He's a retired farmer, and he has a master's degree in education, and he has an extensive history of community involvement, including serving on the Washington County Planning Commission. So he will have the privilege of the first question. Please, city club members only, line up to, well actually we're, um, I think it's being co-sponsored today by the Ur Urban League, so you uh, have the privilege of asking questions as well. And questions should be asked within 30 seconds or less. Thank you, Marcus. My first comment is I think the Urban League of Portland did an excellent job when they decided to hire Vanessa. I compliment <laughs> them. My first contact with the Urban League of Portland was in 1955 when a high school teacher of mine in a class of all white kids uh, brought in someone from the Portland Urban League to talk to us and that was the very first time I had ever in my life thought about racism. And so the Urban League has done uh, numerous things for many folks in many different ways over the years and I, I still remember that and I was only 16 at the time. Vanessa. Um, Renee Mitchell had quite a column in the paper this last week saying uh, that so many of the organizations serving youth in our city are folding up due to lack of money and other problems. And I wondered if you could comment on that and what the Urban League might be doing to kind of fill that gap, if any. Well, thank you for your uh, wonderful compliment. But um, that is a good question because there are a lot of nonprofits that are actually going to be closing their doors in the next six months. And I'm glad that um, Renee Mitchell wrote another article because there is a very important organization named House of Emoja that is not closing, but they serve some of the most at-risk kids. And one of the things that we're focusing on is with one of our efforts with our um, youth leadership program that we will combine with our academic program is to serve some of those kids that have fallen through the cracks. And we want to start off small, so we're working with Roosevelt and we plan to work with Jefferson. But our goal is to help them kids in academic success, stay in school, work with their parent or guardian, but also develop an internship piece for them so that we can help them understand that they have a chance. But we also want to partner with other organizations that serve at-risk youth. So we do a lot of work with a lot of different organizations, whether it's through advocacy, or through other kinds of services, because we don't provide social services, and there are other good organizations that do that. So if we can't provide that service, like we will partner with Sun Schools and we would refer them to providers that can do that. But our focus is we want to do for those kids that 
are on the edge of losing them is we want to reach to those kids. These are not your best and your brightest. These are kids that right now don't have a place and are really not connected to services. We want to help them through academics, but also through business internships. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member, and, and on that last point, um, I was listening on the radio the other day and I just caught the end of a story uh, where our governor was speaking and it was at some event, and I, I didn't catch the first part of it, but basically he was making the point that we, need, we as a state need to think more carefully about uh, employment, particularly for young people, and he said with some passion, not every kid needs to go to college. Um, we, we need to understand this and make opportunities available. Not every kid needs to go to college. And I was a little bit stunned by that because it seems to me most of us go around saying education is the future and, and most of us are thinking about college education. And I don't know if you heard that comment or read that comment, but I'm curious whether that's helpful to you and your organization to have our governor saying with passion, not every kid needs to go to college or is, or is that uh, the wrong message or an unhelpful message? Um, I'm on the Oregon State Board of Education, as that was mentioned earlier, so I've had an opportunity to hear the governor talk about um, what he's trying to do with our educational system. And I think um, what, he, what he's trying to send the message is that not all kids um, are going to go to a four-year school. And that is the reality. They're not all kids are going to go to a four-year school. But, as I mentioned yesterday in our State Board of Education meeting, we are dealing with a global economy where you have kids in China and in India who are coming out so competitive and so educated, speaking many languages, and are ready to come here and be competitive to a level where our kids cannot even stand next to them. So my response was, when you're dealing with that kind of dynamic, if you have a kid that has the ability to go to college, we need to be encouraging to go to college. But for somebody who may not be at that level, the first step is getting them to high school in a meaningful way to make sure that their diploma is not seat time, that they show some proficiency. And then we need to be talking about, is there another option? Is there like community college or technical schools so that they can get into a job that pays a good wage? So, response. Chris Smith, City Club member. Um, Vanessa, I was struck as you went through your list of uh, statistical disparities that there's uh, another statistic that you were too polite to mention, which is the, uh, the number of people of color in City Club. And as a member of the City Club Board of Governors, I would love to get your advice on how we can expand the box uh, and become more inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I think I've had a couple members of the city come, come and talk to me, and, and I'll be very honest with you. I think part of um, the discussion needs to be around in being inclusive and also be willing to discuss topics that are of interest to different communities. There's good topics that you have, and I've seen them. I've been to your lunches, and I've watched the television, and I see them. But there are other issues that we may want to talk about. And also, um, be willing maybe to do a little something different and maybe have meetings in different areas where you can get different groups of people that are willing to come more comfortable in that area. Coming downtown, for a lot of people, um, people just don't want to do that. And it was, it's, it's good for business people because they can just walk or take a, the max right here. But for people who work or live other places, um, they're not going to be more willing to come downtown for these kinds of meetings on a Friday at noontime. So um, that's, I guess that would be my response. And also, let me add this. I would also say be creative in your outreach. There are so many sororities and fraternities and professional organizations that you can reach to and reach out to and include. So. Tamsin Wassell, a uh, City Club member. In 2003, uh, the City Club did a report on community policing, and one of our recommendations was to increase the diversity of the Portland Police Bureau. And indeed, out of that uh, recommendation, the Bureau did embrace that recommendation. 
but actually with very little success. Do you have any thoughts about why that's been true? Um, I think to, to increase community policing, um, increasing the diverse workforce is definitely a step. And I think, and I'll, I'll address that and tell you why I think there needs to be more things that need to be done. But um, if you're going to talk about increasing your diversity in your, amongst your police forces, is that your time? First of all, um, you're going to have to build relationship with these kids to help them want even a trust in that system and trust in a police officer. And so that takes some work. That takes some time. Um, because the first thing that doesn't pop, I mean, coming to a kid's head being a police officer, is not, that's not the first thing they think about. And especially if they had bad run-ins and incidents with police officers. So um, I think there needs to be some communication and better probably marketing, but there needs to be a long-term strategy for diversity. I think also when it talks about community policing though, even though you may hire different officers of color, sometimes they can be your worst officers because it's a culture within the police force. It's about when you come out on the street, you gotta understand that badge means something. Don't abuse it. It is not, does not take a lot to go up and talk to someone like a human being for basic traffic stops. And I think a lot of times people, regardless of their race, abuse that power. So it's about building trust, building relationships. It's about training officers that how different people may react. You know, when you're dealing with people with mental illness, people who speak other languages, people with different cultures. So I would say it's more about a culture change and training more than just bringing on different people of colors. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Carol Witherell, City Club member. Um, in May, at Lewis and Clark College, we had a statewide summit on cultural competence with a diverse group of educators, civic leaders who serve youth um, in our state, and um, legislators, and um, teacher educators, and administrator educators. Um, we, our task was to define cultural competence for educators. And part of that definition that we agreed upon was a commitment to advocacy and equity and social justice. That part of the definition is now being challenged by a group of legislators who believe that it's a partisan agenda. Can you respond to that? And also, for our City Club um, civic group, give us some top priorities for, um, that com for living that commitment, for walking in the road. Um, I, I would say that I think the, com the, the message got confused. Being culturally competent as a teacher is about preparing a teacher to be able to come into a classroom and to be able to teach to the diverse students that they're going to deal with, regardless of their background. Being able to deal with in that, that environment. Being able to effectively teach and reach with different strategies and styles. I think the piece about the advocacy or commitment to advocacy for um, social advocacy, social justice, uh, people have taken that one part and are under the assumption that cultural competency is trying to force teachers to basically be social justice advocates. And if you don't believe in that, you can't be a teacher. Um, we talked about this yesterday in our State Board of Education meeting and trying to help separate out the message is probably first in order is because culture competency um, and I, I wasn't able at the May thing so I wasn't able to be part of the discussion but culture competency um, uh, is, is, is different than advocating for social justice. I would say that something that comes into my mind is and we discussed this and I don't think I got an answer to my question is what is the underlying motive what is the underlying motive? Are you trying to stop cultural competency? Or do you honestly believe that, that we're trying to advocate that teachers be social justice advocates? See, I, I, I'm confused as to what is their argument. I have, they're not clear um, as to me as to what their problem is with cultural competency besides that one little phrase. So you have to ask yourself and ask them because they work for us. You having a diverse group of kids 
You have an achievement gap here. You have teachers who are saying, this is a good thing. We need us to be prepared. We need us to be successful. Why do you have a problem with it? And as far as priorities for the um, City Club, one of the things is I would say is be, it would be helpful is if you could help, and many of the other champions, is to separate them arguments. Separate out those arguments, because they're trying to combine them and confuse the issue. Separate out the arguments and talk to what cultural competency is really about, preparing teachers. And don't let that be a part of confusing the message. And I would also say um, priority is, I mean, you guys did some, you guys put out some wonderful reports about how the importance of cultural competency could really help, um, really help the teachers and, and backed it up with some research. I mean, I think that would be, I think that would be wonderful. Irwin Mandel, City Club member and also a member of the Chiefs Forum. Uh, Chief Foxworth has instituted a 40-hour in-service training for every member of the Bureau, from himself down to every officer on the beat. Part of this has been training in cultural competency. And from the reports I've heard back, it's been quite a surprise to many officers. Have you thought perhaps of actually speaking to Chief Foxworth about the training that the police officers go through now? We actually were a part of early on the discussions when, because um, we were part, uh, Urban League was part of the AMA ad hoc social justice group. And so we were meeting with them on a regular basis about the resolution that the city council approved, about working with the state legislature around the grand jury process and in increasing the training, the number of weeks for training. Um, and we had discussions with the police chief about um, his training program. I think that. It's a good start, but it doesn't go far enough. And he's well aware of um, where all of us that were part of that process stood. And I think for him it was a funding issue, but it was also when you're dealing with such a culture that needs to be kind of turned around, um, you take some baby steps to get there. I'm glad he is moving in that direction, um, but again, it's a baby step. There's more that needs to be done. I'm Karen Williams, and I'm honored to be here as a member of the Board of the Directors of the Urban League. I, Vanessa, you have exchanged wonderful concepts and ideas with these people, and you've done something I am so just screamingly proud of. I'm going to ask you to share some numbers. Would you please tell these folks about the hard results you've achieved through the Centers for Academic Readiness? We have, you know, um, just to give you a little history about this. We had this, um, we had this alternative high school called the Portland Street Academy. And we were dealing with kids who were at risk, dropped out, um, really at a point, a lot older, couldn't read and write. And it was an expensive program to run. And to be honest, we weren't that successful. And there were a lot more alter alternative high schools around us. So we chose to not do that anymore. And we went to Portland Public Schools and we asked them, what is it that you would like for us to do? And this is why we don't want to do this program. Um, at first, they gave us some pushback because they wanted us to continue with the program. But then they started thinking and they said, um, we don't have a lot of services for middle schools. And we're seeing that when they get to the ninth grade, they're so far behind that is there something you can do academically to help these kids be prepared for the ninth grade? So we went to a couple of middle schools. And Ackley Green just kind of jumped all over it. Um, and we wanted to kind of do a project because this was a new venture for us. So Ackley Green, the teachers were very excited and they asked us to focus on math. They were not doing well in math. So uh, what we did is we designed a program with their assistance. And what it is is we hired certified teachers, retired Portland Public School teachers or new teachers coming out of Concordia or University of Portland. These are diverse teachers. They're experienced in teaching children of color and poor kids. They know the strategies of how to reach these families and how to reach these kids. And what we do is during the day, Tuesday through Thursday, during the day we partner with the teacher in the class, they've identified the kids that are failing, and then what they do is they work with the regular classroom, and then we work one-on-one -on -one or in groups with these kids that are failing. And each teacher, we call them academic coach, serves 15 kids at a time, because a lot of these kids are so far behind. And 
They do pre-tests, they do post-tests. We follow the attendance records, the report cards, progress reports, and every Monday, our coaches contact those parents, either through phone or home visits. And we give those parents practical solutions on how they can help their kid. But what we try to do is empower them to go to the school and advocate for yourself. So we don't want to do it for them. We want them to get up and go into the school the best way they know how and to find out about how their kids are doing. And what we've done is last year we served 66 kids. I have actually the director of education in the audience. We served 66 kids. A lot of the kids were way behind. And we did sixth and seventh and eighth graders. And at the end of the year, what was the results? Um, Eighty-seven percent of his kids exceeding. What that means is they took a test in the fall and they took their, their regular tests in the spring and kids either met, increased their points, or exceeded benchmarks. This year, second year to the project, we have 55 kids, right? Sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. And the testing is happening this week, so we should know what the outcomes are. But right now, we can see already improvement through grade cards, um, through their attendance records. I mean, parents are active. We had a parent-teacher event um, in April, and our coaches, I mean, they were working hard to get those parents, primarily African-Americans, because they're trying to create a new African-American parent-teacher association in Ockley Green. 47 parents showed up and stayed there from 6 to past 8.30, asking questions about their kids' education. That was amazing. The principal walked out of there amazed because he ain't never had them kind of results. Parents weren't showing up. So it's gotten kids excited. We have parents now come and saying, can I take my kid? Put, can please put my kid in your program? I'm seeing the results. I mean, they're asking us. It's an expensive program because you're dealing with certified teachers who are trained and prepared and working with kids. And at first, the teachers in the classrooms, they were using our coaches as how to control the classroom. But we gave them strategies on how to clean code classroom, but that's not why we were there. But now, um, and another dynamic is that parents have now built such a trusting relationship with our coaches, is we're now trying to convince them, build that same relationship with that teacher. You can do it with that teacher. We'll help you, but we'll do, do it with that teacher. So that's kind of the result of this program. Um, extreme success, because these kids, um, diverse group of kids, is not one, it's primarily African American, but you do have a lot of poor white kids and some Hispanic kids that are in the program, but um, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with the results. But this was a partnership through Portland Public Schools, United Way, and Quest to come together around this program and really focus in on academics and math. Um, hi, I'm Susan Pierce, City Club member. Um, another columnist in another paper recently this week stated that he held that, I hope I can paraphrase correctly, he held that little hope for diversity and elimination of racism in Portland. What is your opinion and what shall we do? What should we do better? Um, I think first, I mean, I think that, I think the city, I've, I've run into a lot of um, good intentioned people who want to do the right thing. I think the challenge for the city is the, the difficulty to discuss race. I can't be, tell you how many meetings I've been in and spoken to many groups or come into presentations like this and I share this data and I get people behind coming up later and saying, it's not about race, it's about class, it's about poverty. Let's not focus on race. Um, and I get that all the time. And I think that until you can have those conversations in a meaningful way and not with just African Americans talking about it and always talking about it, or Latinos talking about it always, but when we can come together in a room like this and have a meaningful, honest conversation and hear one another and then come up with some practical solutions, will you begin to dig at that? But until that happens, you're going to always have perceptions that this is place is a racist place. And I mentioned before in my speech, well, I've actually talked to people who have made racist comments and have some racist views. They don't know that, but it's been very difficult in the last two years to talk about that subject. Yeah, last question, probably a lighter question. Mike Pullen, Urban League member. 
Um, I worked for both of your predecessors, and I remember one of the biggest uh, challenges is that in a city with this kind of um, diversity or lack of, that every group in town tends to want to come to the Urban League president and ask for assistance diversifying their organization, whether it's the Boy Scouts or the Symphony or the environmental community. I mean, it, it was just a never-ending parade of um, people asking for that kind of help, and I wanted to know, has that been your experience? And if it is, how do you prioritize all those uh, requests for that kind of worthwhile assistance? Thank you, Mike. He is, he's been a big supporter of the Urban League, and he used to work for the Urban League, did some excellent work for, um, for our organization, and continues to, serves on our dinner committee. Yes, we do get that. I get many, many calls um, from organizations all over, not just Portland, all over this state, asking for us to help them either diversify a board or diversify a workforce or serve a population. Um, and it's been real hard to stay focused, especially as you have nonprofits who go out of business. I mean, more and more people are, are has become more visible or reaching out to us. And uh, one of the things that I do to stay focused is we have a strategic plan and we stick to that strategic plan. That is a living document for us. And staff know it. They know what we do. Um, so when we go out and talk to people and they start talking about other kinds of things, they're real clear. We do education and employment, economic kind of development things. What I try to do is when people get that call is I try to link them to other leaders in this community, other community members that can help them in this community. We are not the only organization. I'm not the only person that you can talk to. You have wonderful people that you can reach out to and get some advice from. I see Harold Williams in here. I see Kate Turan. I see Karen Powell, Kathleen Sadat, Tanya Parker. All of these people, Erling Penson, all these people have been in this community and you can reach out to them as well. But what it takes is some creativity to do some outreach and also the willingness to talk to other people and be understanding that be able be willing to take the direct conversation that will take place. Thank you very much. I would like to point out that uh, Vanessa's comments are comments that we've heard before here at the City Club and heard for many years. Uh, we have, for some of you who may not know this, we've done three reports on race in Portland since I think 1950, which uh, are available through the club. And we did an interesting uh, report on affordable housing in Portland and we're now involved with an advocacy ed effort on affordable housing in Portland. So we're trying to be at the forefront of these things. We know we can do better and I have a plan. But in the meantime, thank you so much and I think we've learned a lot about Portland's um, community and about what you're doing and especially the work you're doing with the schools and with the parents is just outstanding. So thanks so much. We are adjourned.